everybody. I am Katrina Marcos, and I teach biology here at Western. Um, this is my 10th year here at Western, and it was, um, actually, Stacy doesn't know this, but this was really great timing because this is actually 10 years since I defended my master's thesis, which was on zebra mussels, which is an invasive species. So I've got some stuff thrown in there on zebra mussels because it, um, took up about three years of my life, so I figured I should, I should talk about it. So, um, I do require audience participation. So how many of you have heard of invasive species, the term? Right? Okay, good. A fair few. That is awesome. Um, the problem we get into when we talk about invasive species is that they are called by many other names. Okay, here's just a list of a few things that invasive species can be called. Introduced, exotic, um, noxious is one of my favorites. Not obnoxious, but um, we could throw them in that category as well. Um, so we get a lot of distribution of vocabulary uh, in regards to invasive species. I'll try to call them invasive, but it all depends on your area of expertise. So individuals that study plant ecology probably call things uh, weed or noxious. If we're talking about aquatic, which was what I worked on, um, nuisance species was kind of the preferred term. But all of these, th all of these things refer to the same thing, an invasive species. Um, but we do have a common definition of an invasive species. And again, you'll see they use some of these other terms that I mentioned. So these are things that did not originate in the area that they are now found. Okay, They got there some way, some shape, some form. And we'll talk about those um, ways in just a moment. So they have to get there to wherever we're looking at them in, and they have to cause a problem, okay? Um, usually we don't notice things until they cause a problem. Um, and I'll mention something about that when we get to talking about uh, management in just a minute. So they have to cause a problem, um, one of which is economic issues, okay? So uh, they have to cost somebody money to uh, draw somebody's attention to it or environmental, okay, which is really the deep down heart of it. Um, but also, we notice when these things cause harm to human health, okay? So I don't know if we rank these at all, but, you know, causing harm to human health and costing us money are two big reasons these things get noticed. So, we talked about, or I mentioned what an invasive species is, but what can it be? What types of organisms can be invasive? And the answer is anything, okay? These can be items found on land, which are terrestrial, or they can be in the water, which are aquatic. Um, and we can have many different types. These things can be vertebrates, invertebrates, plants, and even diseases. Okay, so there are two um, Wyoming examples of pathogens and diseases I'm going to get to at the end. So really, it can be anything. And again, it has to get to a place where it didn't come from, and it has to cause some problems. And just to reiterate here, these were all things within that definition of an invasive species from that particular executive order. But I want to point this out. And this is, this is data from, this is, oh, my pointer, there we go, um, from 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the estimated annual cost for managing and dealing with invasive species was $138 million. And that was the low end of the estimate. And so you can imagine that 10 years from then, this is likely increased, okay? Given um, a couple of human uh, participation issues that we're gonna talk about. 
Um, ecological effects. Okay, so I said that this is kind of the, the, the root of the problem, right? Uh, when we talk about something getting to where it shouldn't be, um, they can displace native species. Okay, so something that evolved there for hundreds and thousands of years is now outcompeted by something that is better at what that native species did. Okay, um, it can disrupt communities. So not just one species, but let's say an invasive species um, alters the habitat that another organism might live on or in or feed off of. Okay, so not direct competition, but these things can also alter the lifestyles of other organisms. This is a big one. This feeds back into our economic effects. Right, we can decrease livestock production. Okay, people lose money. Um, nutrient and water cycles. And then organisms or species that are already threatened or endangered, if they are presented with another hardship, okay, this can have even more detrimental effects. So invasive species can get to where they didn't come from a couple of different ways. There are natural pathways. Okay, so think about the flow of a river. Okay, some plant species may break off and travel downstream. Okay, that's a natural pathway. Uh, but we concern ourselves mostly with our human pathways. Okay, and this is a not necessarily all inclusive list, but we're going to talk about a couple of these examples when I talk about some specific species. So um, in our area, in Wyoming, um, recreation becomes an issue. One species I'm going to talk about in, towards the end, um, travels in firewood. Okay, so people go camping, they take extra firewood and they go to their next campsite. Okay, that can cause a problem and it's not something that you would normally think of or think about. Um, illegal stockings, we have an example of that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and this is kind of indirectly, but pathogens spread. So let's say that invasive species has a disease that non-natives would be susceptible to. It's not necessarily that the pathogen is invasive, but that, um, that spreader okay, would be um, contributing to that non-native um, species getting that disease. Uh, this is a great one. I don't know how often this happens because we do have fairly strict protocols for uh, what we do with species or organisms once we're done with them. Okay. But if we think about all of these human pathways, uh, do you think there are rules guiding these issues when it comes to organisms or anything? Tice, you're nodding your head yes. That's what you get for coming and being in my class. You get called on. Um, absolutely, but think about uh, what has to happen, right? So if this is illegal, Okay, if moving firewood is frowned upon, someone has to get caught doing it. Someone has to be punished for doing it. And if we think about it, the, the, the punishment usually has to be worth it, right? In order for people not to take that risk, right? So someone has to get caught, these laws have to be implemented. Um, so all of these things play a, play a role in maybe preventing these human pathways from happening when we know they can. So, not all species or species that might, be become, might become invasive become invasive. There are steps to the process, okay? And the first step is introduction. So something, again, has to get to where it's not supposed to be, okay? And then it has to establish a local population. Okay, so it has to grow within that area. Then it has to spread beyond that area. 
And then finally, it has to have an impact. So you might have species that are introduced but don't become established or become established and don't spread regionally, okay? So you can have species that get disrupted at any one of these steps, okay? Um, if I were to pose a question, remember that $138 million I mentioned, okay? Where do you think efforts should be focused if we're going to save a little bit of money in regards to invasive species management? If you had to guess, what, what step would you try to prevent? Introduction. Absolutely. Okay. Um, has anybody ever heard the, the uh, medical adage, the best protection is early? Uh, no, 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 that's right. The best protection is early detection. Same goes for invasive species. If we know that invasive species are in our area, we can take steps to prevent that introduction. And we, I do have one example of that. Um, in a little bit. Much less costly to stop species before they become introduced than to try to get rid of them. Okay? These things are really good at what they do once they get to where they're going. And so it becomes an issue of where do we want to focus? Do we want to plan and prevent or do we want to become reactive? And we do. We want to plan and prevent these um, invasions. So this was my title slide. I didn't change a lick of information on here. This was my title slide for uh, my, my master's thesis. So um, I did research on the zebra mussel. Um, this was a really cool opportunity that I had. I went, I went right back to the same university that I did my undergrad in to um, work with a professor that I had had in undergrad. And I just thought this was the coolest thing because I grew up with family in Buffalo, New York. Okay? And we would take regular summer trips over to Lake Erie uh, to hang out at um, Crystal Beach. And when I was little, probably eight, nine, huge infestation in Lake Erie of zebra mussels. Of course, I didn't know what they were. I thought they were really cool little shells. So we would all we would swim out to this platform, and this huge concrete platform was just covered with these things. And so I thought that, I thought this was the coolest thing. I took my bucket out there. I scraped them out. I took them to the shore, and it's like, oh, these are the coolest things in the world. Pretty sure some of those shells made it back to Oklahoma with me. Um, I hope they weren't alive because that was probably illegal, okay? I was, I was nine, right? Um, but I knew what they were, and so when this opportunity came up to study zebra mussels, I jumped at it and I thought it was kind of cool. I was like, hey, I know what these are, and now they're here, and now it's a problem, and now I want to help do something about it. So how many, I should have asked this before, how many of you have heard of zebra mussels before? Less than have heard of introduced species, um, but I'll roll with it, okay? Um, these guys originated in the Ponto-Caspian region, so Black Sea, Caspian Sea area, and they were introduced to the United States somewhere in the mid-1980s via Lake St. Clair in Ontario, Canada. So um, a little bit about these guys. These are aquatic bivalves, so they live in the water, and they're filter feeders. And they have this really cool floating larval stage, which we'll bring up in just a moment. Um, so this is an image of the sightings or reported sightings of zebra mussels in the United States as of 2020. But this is a really cool interactive distribution. So, so watch with me. 
as we see the spread year to year. Man, we did really good keeping it in the east until about, what, 2000? Let's find that year again. There we go. Up until about 2005, 2006. Anybody venture a guess what may have kept those to the east? Doesn't have to be right or wrong. We knew about them, right? And we had systems in place for, for finding them, okay? For a while there in the early 2000s, you couldn't go to any body of water right there along that line without having your boat checked very, very thoroughly. And how that got over to California, couldn't tell you. Um, that would have had to been a very, very moist, very rapid transport over there. So, just for an idea for scale, that's been our spread of zebra mussels in the United States. Um, so as I mentioned, these guys are filter feeders. They can filter anywhere from one to five liters of water a day. And these are things that are small, okay? The vast majority are maybe one to two centimeters in length. These things are small, and that's a lot of water to filter. Um, so they outcompete these native species for food. They're filtering for algae, and that's what they are consuming. And so they filter more water than the native species, so they get to eat more, okay? Um, they can form very dense, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll call it a colony, um, as high as 779,000 individuals per square meter. Okay, so that's, that's something outlined. I wish I had thought to tape something here, right? So a very small area of space that these guys can occupy, and they can latch on to whatever they latch onto, okay, I know that's a technical term, um, but they do so with these little guys here. These guys are called Bissell threads, and they are like glue, like just, they grab on, and the only way to get them off is to physically tear them apart and tear these threads. Um, so they're very difficult to remove from wherever they get. Um, they do have this planktonic, larval stage, which allows them to float in the water, which helped them get over here. They were brought over from that Caspian Sea region in the ballast water of a ship. Okay, completely by accident. No one knew they were there, but then they got to where they're going, and then they had an impact. Um, and then again, the adults are sessile, which means they stay where they are once they get there, okay? And again, they just latch on to whatever, they, whatever substrate they attach themselves to. Um, so when they do invade ecosystems, they can have a number of effects. One is nutrient cycling, okay? So they can affect uh, nutrients in the water, like ammonia, like phosphorus, or, or I should ant say and or, um, shifts in native food webs. So remember I mentioned those community impacts those would be examples of those community impacts. Um, and then they can also affect phytoplankton. So these, this is, um, think algae. That's gonna bother me. Algae, and then finally turbidity. Um, so turbidity is like the cloudiness of the water, which 
when these guys initially came over to the Great Lakes, people thought this was a really cool thing. Like, oh, I can see the bottom of, you know, I can be five foot deep out in, out in Lake Erie, and I can see the bottom. So they thought it was really cool. But then, upon further inspection, these impacts on biomass, our native food webs, and the nutrients, uh, the bad kind of outweighed the good. Um, economically, these things can affect um, water treatment facilities and electric generation facilities. So think about um, an empty pipe, right? I don't know how, how big these things are, but think of a pipe um, and imagine that density of zebra mussels. These things can completely clog water intake or output structures, okay? And you can't, well, you can kill them. You can dump bleach in the water, but that's generally not a good way to clean up after invasive species to kill everything else. It doesn't work. And hand removal of these items, again, is really, really hard because they, they cause that, that structure blockage. Um, from 1989 to 2004, an estimated $264 million just from zebra mussels alone. Okay, so of that $138 billion annually, think about annually how much that is costing us and how much maybe could have been saved if we had known they were coming, right? We didn't know because it was completely by accident, right? They came over on the, on the water that was taken up in that ship. Um, so I'm not going to belabor the rest of my master's degree research, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. So I wanted to look at water quality and plankton communities. So in Oklahoma and Kansas, um, lots of reservoirs. And up until 2000s, a lot of research hadn't been done on how zebra mussels would affect reservoirs. Um, reservoirs differ from natural lakes in their rate of turnover, in their temperature, in their uh, aquatic communities that make them up. Um, so I picked a couple reservoirs and I built these things, okay? Um, tell you a real funny story about, you guys know that uh, spray foam that you spray to like seal cracks? That stuff's very sticky before it dries completely. Very sticky. And when it leaks out onto your lab room floor and you panic and you go to pick it up with your hands and you become covered in the stuff and you literally have to soak your hands in acetone to get that stuff off. Um, so lots of blood, sweat, and tears went into these giant plastic bags. And what did I do with them? I put them in lakes, excuse me, reservoirs. Put them in reservoirs and filled them up with reservoir water. Had about 50-50 with zebra mussels, 50-50 without. And then I waited and I collected samples. This is a tool called the Secchi disk that allows you to measure turbidity, turbidity a tow net. This was to collect uh, plankton samples. And this is an integrated uh, depth collector, for lack of a better word, um, that allowed me to collect water from the top to the bottom, right? So I wouldn't want to just collect something from the tippy top. So I got to get in there, and it was a well-mixed sample. Um, turns out, I didn't see a lot of difference in the water quality, but I did see some differences with phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, but we had some issues with this uh, research because in this reservoir, I didn't have this nice structure to um, uh, hook those two. These guys were just literally floating out in the middle of the reservoir. And um, if you know anything about summers in Oklahoma, there's lots of rainstorms and thunderstorms. And so I had most of my Winfield, Winfield uh, mesocosms go under. So um, we didn't get great results from this. But I also did something in the laboratory. 
and this was fun. Um, so I did this three times with water from three different reservoirs. Um, so if the big ones were called mesocosms, these were microcosms. So think these guys were just your standard gallon, gallon sized buckets. And I did similar tests, the turbidity, the ammonia, the phosphorus, um, and let these guys hang out for 96 hours. Lots of, I wish I could show you the giant electrical mess that was behind there. Um, I fixed it, it was messy at first, but then I fixed it. Lots of timers um, because I had to regulate uh, the light to simulate um, natural conditions. And I'll share with you the one really cool thing that we found here, and this, that's why this is the only graph um, I've got on here. Um, my results disagreed with what research at the time had, uh, uh, had been put forth. So uh, cyanobacteria are kind of the bad algae. Okay, these are algaes that can cause algal blooms. They cause um, water taste, water quality um, issues in drinking water. And it had been shown that zebra mussels actually tend to avoid these. And mine didn't. So I thought that we, we thought that was pretty interesting. Um, but they also made up a big component of all reservoirs, um, bacteria, uh, algal community. So, you know, the zebra mussels, maybe they didn't have anything else to eat. So they went for, they went for the stuff that maybe normally uh, other zebra mussels wouldn't eat. Um, so again, this was, this was, some, I told you guys, this is, this is my 10th, my 10th anniversary of my, my master's degree research. Um, but I did want to throw that in there because we are seeing some westward distribution of the zebra mussel. How many of you uh, boat on Flaming Gorge? How many of you, uh, leave your hands up, leave your hands up. How many of you have ever had your boat stop to be inspected? Oh good, I like that, very nice. Okay, so now you guys know um, that we do do a good job. I like that was about 100%, I'm very happy with that. Um, about 100% of you have um, had your boat checks for invasive species, that's great. Um, so I'm gonna whiz on past here because I want to talk about my, um, my Wyoming invasives. So I had earlier that list of what kinds of things can be invasive. So I went through and found a Wyoming representative of each of those. Because I think it's fun to talk about things locally. And one of these examples is very, very local um, because there are native populations in Wyoming. So we're going to get to that in just a moment. Um, whirling disease. Any trout fishermen in the room? Okay, thank you. It all depends. What kind of fishing do you do? Fly fishing or bait fishing? Any type that catches the fish. Any, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm a fly fisherwoman myself. Um, so, so whirling disease is of particular interest to uh, my extracurricular interests. Um, this is a parasite that causes skeletal deformities in uh, developing trout and salmon. So it got its name, it kind of gets in there and destroys cartilage and you can see the bent tail and the little baby trout and salmon kind of display this characteristic, they swim around in circles. They can't, they can't get anywhere. They're obviously very, very sick. Um, but it is native to places. And we first discovered it in Pennsylvania in 1958. Um, how did it get here? Probably through imported trout. So uh, essentially stock fishing, okay? So some of those fish were sick, it comes in. Um, it actually has a really interesting life history. It has uh, the trout and salmon as a host but it also, the way it's spread is through a worm that the trout eat. 
Okay, so these guys die, the parasite is released, the worms eat the parasite, and then the trout eat the worms. Okay, so um, in terms of this thing is, you know, trying to be well managed, you know, who do you manage? Do you manage the trout, the parasite, or the worm? Right, you could really interfere at any stage. Okay, um, and I'm not an expert in this, and I don't know what the experts are doing, but my logical brain says let's, you know, fight it on all fronts. Um, so this is our this is our aquatic pathogen representative. Our aquatic plant representative is curly pondweed. Okay, that's a fun name, right? Um, this is actually one of the, the um, if you guys are interested in learning more about invasive species, there is a list um, called the five most unwanted Wyoming aquatic invasive species. And this is included in the aquatic plants. Um, how did it get here? Again, it was an accident. Fish stocking, okay? So you had a bucket, some of the plant was scooped up, went, got delivered somewhere else, okay? Um, what does it do? Inhibits growth of native species, and this stuff can form such thick mats that people can't boat in the areas, okay? Um, and if they do boat, it can uh, disrupt motors and um, things like that. So we don't, we don't want it where it shouldn't be. Um, Russian olive, how many of you have seen a Russian olive in Rock Springs or Green River? These are invasive. Um, and these are an example of something that was introduced on purpose. It was ornamental, it was pretty. Horticulture brought it here. We thought it was neat, okay? Um, and it crowds out native species. Um, another, another example of a terrestrial plant, I don't know if we have them in the area, maybe Chuck or Stacy. do we have salt cedars? I don't see them in Wyoming. Okay. Okay. Um, but they're nearby. So salt cedars are another terrestrial plant that can cause big problems in uh, riparian zones, so areas along stream beds. And they can affect what fish, what invertebrates go in the water. So these things have very far reaching effects. Um, one of my favorites to talk about, I talk about this in my biology class all the time um, the starling. Uh, it's everywhere. It is so widespread in the United States. Um, and the reason it got here is because people wanted to bring over from England every species of bird mentioned in the works of William Shakespeare. What a great reason, right? They thought it would, you know, they are settling a new area. Hey, let's bring these things that are meaningful to our culture. Great, except that outcompetes native species, uh, most native songbirds, uh, and can have a really big impact on crop species. Okay, so this is, that's one of my favorite reasons for introduction. I love it, I just think it's silly. Um, let's see, our emerald ash borer. Okay, so this is one that has not reached Wyoming yet. Um, to my understanding. And this was the one I was mentioning when we talked about um, cutting firewood. Okay, so this is why places um, have local bundles of wood for you to, um, to use when you go, go camping. Okay, this is a uh, public service announcement. You don't want to cut wood in your backyard and go take it into Utah and burn it. Go take it into Colorado and burn it. Okay, these things are um, voracious. Uh, ash trees specifically lose their canopy within two years and are dying within three to four years. Okay, so these are a big deal. Um, how did they get here? Accidentally. Okay, so sometimes we've got the silly reasons like Shakespeare and sometimes we have the accidents, but now that we know they're here and we know that they are in states that border Wyoming. Remember I mentioned, where do, we, where do you want to intervene? You want to prevent these things, okay? You don't want to become reactive. Um, 
I'll talk about another insect that is um, near and dear to my heart, uh, the mountain pine beetle. Mountain pine beetle is actually not invasive to Wyoming, but it is a voracious pest. Um, my husband and I vacation every year, except this year, obviously, um, in a, at a uh, working dude ranch in southern Colorado. And it has been detrimental to see their pine forests um, just go from green to red. Every year there's a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So when we consider these things invasive species, that list of names we named, noxious species, uh, pest species, okay? We might have pest species that were supposed to be here, but because of human behavior, like travel and moving firewood, we've kind of, kind of made things worse, okay? So these are just things to kind of, kind of keep in mind. Um, here is our, this is our terrestrial pathogen, um, white pine blister rust is a fungus um, that affects white pines. And again, an accident, white pine seedlings imported from Europe. So again, we're settling the area around 1900, coming over saying, oh, these were nice. Where we grew up in England, let's bring them here. Okay, um, some of them were sick and that has continued to spread. And since we're in Rock Springs and Green River, I had to throw in the burbot. How many of you have heard of burbot? Yay, good. Uh, any burbot bash participants? Yay, good, okay. Um, so the burbot is actually does have a native range in Wyoming. Um, oh, the quality's not super great, but here is our big sandy river. Here's our Fontenelle Reservoir. Here's Flaming Gorge. Below this little dashed line, these are invasive. Above, they are not, okay? So I hope you guys can appreciate how challenging invasive species management really is because those burbot don't care, <laughs> right? They don't see that line and say, hey, I'm not supposed to be here, okay? Um, now, they did get here illegally. They were illegally introduced um, in the upper Colorado River Basin um, and have since reached Flaming Gorge Reservoir. Um, and before I moved here, I had never heard of burbot. Um, but I do think, those of you who have participated, thank you, I do think the burbot bash is a really fun way to um, call attention to an invasive species. For those of you who don't know, the burbot bash is essentially a fishing competition that says catch as many and hopefully as many large reproductively active ones as you can and we don't put them back, right? Um, so I think, oh, I can't remember. I was reading an article. Um, and it said the most recent number of, those of you who have participated, what, what are the, the number of burbot that get removed? Do you guys know? Three or four thousand a year. Oh yeah, it's, it's a huge number. It's in the thousands, if not in the double digit thousands, right, 20 or so. Um, but again, just wanting to point out that here is native, here is introduced. These things are continuous water bodies and it becomes um, very difficult to manage something here when it's okay here. But again, I, do, I am a fan of the idea of the burbot bash. Um, so that's the end of my Wyoming invasive species and this is my last thought. Um, we are in a time of global change, okay? Um, well, except Right now, given our pandemic, we have a very large uh, amount of global travel, okay? Um, and we're experiencing global climate change. So we kind of have to think of, and these people that work in invasive species management really do have to try to look into a crystal ball when they're writing legislation about these things. What is this gonna look like in 10 years? Because how are we going to have to change management? Um, altered travel more of those invasives becoming established. 
that global change may change the impact of the existing natives, or excuse me, existing invasives. Um, their distribution may change. Um, we've seen this a lot with uh, mosquitoes. We've seen increasing ranges of mosquitoes because there are areas that can now support the warmer climates that they need to experience. Um, and then something that may have worked a year ago, given the global changes and the global impacts that we're seeing, may not work 5, 10, 15 years from now. So um, just, again, food for thought. I always kind of tell my students that all of what I'm telling you is, is food for thought. So I hope that um, you guys have walked away with a little bit of knowledge and maybe some appreciation for the challenges involved in recognizing, naming, classifying, and fighting invasive species. So that is it for me. Thank you guys for coming. I should ask if you have questions, because that's what you do at the end of the talk. <laughs> and I know that I have to repeat them if you have them. So I will take questions if there are questions. Anybody? Come on, Kurt, students that I've already seen this morning. Ahem, ahem. Nobody, 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 nobody. Yes, Chuck. Okay. So it seems like there's less boat checks now as they travel around. Is that just because they found them ineffective? Um, I have, I have a couple of guesses. Um, so I did my research in those reservoirs in Kansas. I never got stopped once. Why? Because they were already there. So if you're going to a body of water that has already had them, I think people become more lax. I don't know if it would be because they are ineffective. I, I, I honestly don't. I mean, it, it, it all depends. Are, are they checking every single boat? Are they checking? They may be ineffective because they're not checking every single boat. I know when we've taken our drift water down below, drift boat down below Fontenelle, you know, there's no one at that drop point. So maybe they are ineffective given the, you know, the rigidity that they would need to be done with to be effective. That would be my best guess. Thank you guys for coming.